Thank you, thank you very much, Des. And um, it looks like you had a fairly resilient workforce here already because it's Friday and everybody turned up. So well, well done to you guys for, uh, for starting out. So um, thanks for the introduction again. Just a little bit of a brief uh, overview of myself before we get going into our main topic today. Uh, again, my name, Alistair Kerr. Uh, one thing just to point out about me before we get going is I'm actually legally blind. So you guys at the back, if you've got your hand up or if you kind of give me a look like you want to ask a question and I ignore you, um, it's not because I'm ignoring you. It's just because I've not seen you. So please throw something, not hard at the head, um, <laughs> down here is okay um, and we'll all be fine. Second thing, so today we're going to really be digging into resilience and burnout and because of that today is a fairly I suppose personal topic for a lot of people. So um, generally in a lot of sessions we run we do ask people to kind of share and bounce things around. This session will be a little bit different in that you know I think it's okay if you don't feel comfortable with sharing or with kind of talking with the person next to you that's okay and I'd ask everyone just to respect that. I will be kind of giving some personal examples just as a bit of a crash test dummy, but just because I do, please don't feel that you have to do. So with that out of the way, um, let's have a little bit of a mud map and a tour of what we're going to be looking at this afternoon in our time together. So really quickly up front, just to put some things into perspective for you guys, uh, some facts and figures about stress and burnout in the education sector. Now this wraps up both the corporate side of things and also the teaching and learning side of things. Understanding resilience, so really unpacking what is resilience and what does that look like? And then that's gonna lead us really nicely into some life lessons in terms of how we can actually become more resilient. And you've got some book packs there and a worksheet that we're gonna work through. And the result of today is you're gonna have enough to walk out of here with a wellbeing master plan that's really gonna help you uh, to be more resilient um, than without having that plan. So without further ado, just to get us really kicked off uh, in the first instance, um, if we could just have a little chat to the person next to us, and I think this one is okay to share, just around five different signs that you see of stress and a couple of different causes of burnout. And we'll do a little bit of a capture after that. So I'll throw over to you guys, just um, one, two minutes, and then we'll, we'll come back and hear what you have to say. For time managing us, because we, um, we did kick off a little bit late, I'll just pull that up there. But it sounds like from the chatter in the room, we do have a pretty good understanding of what are some of those signs. So feel free, what are some of the signs of uh, stress that we've noticed either in ourselves or if we're pretty cool and calm collected in others that we've seen around the office? Sorry? Snappiness, yeah, that's one. Okay, what are some others? Feel free to just yell them out, guys. Crying. Crying, yes. Forgetfulness. Forgetfulness, yes. And not being able to sleep. Not being able to sleep, yeah, disrupted sleep is a really common one. Uh, any others? Headaches. Headaches, yeah, some of those physical type symptoms too. Thanks very much, guys. So what about some of those causes? So what are the things that really get us stressed and, and you know, get us riled up and in, in a bit of a worse state than, than optimal? Mm, uncertainty, really big one. Overwhelming. Overwhelming, yeah. So work demands, those type of things coming at us. Any others? Expectations. Expectations, yeah, and change. And a lot of those things all wrap up, and we'll see as we go through uh, the presentation how they actually cause us to uh, become overwhelmed and become a little bit more stressed than uh, we generally might. Now, to kind of anchor it back, no wonder you guys are really familiar with these signs and symptoms because the causes that you've just mentioned, they're abundant within education. So we've, we've got a lot of change happening, a lot of different stakeholders, a lot of expectations coming both you know, in the corporate world but also out in the field, so with the people that you're dealing with. Again, the figures that we look at down here, they indicate and they, they tell us and what we know from work cover claims is that the education sector is the equal most stressful sector in Australia and they're equal with health. So healthcare and education are at the top. So that's why it's so, so important for us to have a look at resilience and how we can actually become more resilient because we know the evidence is there that it's really sorely needed. Now, one thing I suppose that goes along with resilience is a lot of people do feel guilty taking that time out and actually trying to retune in and take care of themselves. But that's a myth I'd like to really shatter right up front because really we can't do our best for other people and the people that we care about unless we take care of ourselves first. I think, you know, it's really summed up quite nicely in terms of the picture there and the safety message that everybody ignores on the aeroplane in terms of putting their own oxygen mask on first to take care of themselves, that's also true in the wellbeing world. A lot of people put others' needs ahead of their own. And I'm here to tell you today that you don't have to or that you really shouldn't because you really do need to take care of yourself so you can be at your best so that you can take care of your loved ones. Now, We'll unpack resilience a little bit and, and go for a little bit of a quick tour. But so resilience and life is a really interesting thing. 
life is really wrapped up. We've got, we've got all these different things going on and, and we've all got different experiences that we've got. But it's probably fair to say that throughout our entire lives, we'll all come across things that are part beauty, you know, part things that are exciting and great, but also part struggle. To illustrate that, let's have a look through our life cycle. So when we're first born, we kind of come into the world, everything's new and exciting, we get to learn, but we also have that struggle on the other side. We, learn, we start to learn to walk, we start to fall down, we start to have accidents. We then grow up a little bit, we get into that middle school age, we start to have a little bit more independence, we get to know what we can and can't do, but at the same time, as my eight-year-old son is learning, we sometimes hear the word no, and that can really knock us around sometimes. So there's the beauty, but there's also that struggle. When we move into adulthood or kind of early adulthood, um, things are really exciting. We, we get even more independence. But with that, we get a lot of responsibility. We also form some really new, exciting relationships. But on the flip side of that, a lot of, some of those relationships can lead to a bit of hurt. When we get into our older years, our midlife and um, our older years, this is a time where we get to start to slow down. We get to take it a little bit easy. We've, we've worked really hard, but at the same time, some other things such as health conditions start to crop up. So the, all through life, we've got these, this dual thing going on of this pleasure, pleasure pain type dynamic. And for some people, that struggle really becomes overwhelming and it leads to stress and burnout. Now, again, to crush a couple of myths up front here, burnout is often seen because people who don't really have much experience with it think it's this big mysterious kind of concoction that scientists don't really know much about. But that's really couldn't be further from the truth. We know that burnout is a condition that's caused by excessive or prolonged stress. And we know what causes it. We know how to reduce it. On the flip side of that, another myth is that resilient people are only resilient just because they've had a fantastic life. And again, we know that that's just not true. Resilience is the ability to be able to bounce back despite what's coming at us. I really enjoy this quote in terms of summing up what resilience means in terms of if you get knocked down seven times, you get up eight. And that really, really nicely sums up what resilience is. It's the ability to bounce back despite things going wrong for us. In our life, as you've seen, we've all got different adversities that we're going to face. Some of us tend to turn to resilience. We're able to bounce back, able to come through. But others of us turn to burnout. And it's this point that I'm really interested in as a psychologist to be able to help people to turn this way rather than this way. Having a look and, and really thinking about burnout and resilience. Burnout and resilience, they aren't inherent in any type of, uh, they're not wrapped up in wealth, in culture, or in any type of circumstances. Anyone can burn out and anyone can become resilient. To walk you through a couple of examples, people in war-torn countries, some of them can be really resilient, bounce back, forgive their persecutors. Others of them will burn out. Thinking about the poor, again, we might look at them and think, oh, okay, no, it's okay. Like, I would expect many poor people to burn out. But what we find is poor people are some of the happiest people on earth when we do surveys and studies. On the flip side of that, when we look at wealthy people, we might think, hey, they've got it all going on for them. It's all going well. They've got a lot of money, they can do what they want. But that doesn't necessarily stop burnout and mental health issues. So too, people who are lucky. It's really, really common for people who win the lottery, win millions of dollars, to lose that within two to three years and then be potentially even worse off than when, when they, before they won the lottery. Champions, people who are at the top of their game, they're not immune from burnout. In Australia, we have the tall poppy syndrome, like to bring people down. A lot of examples of that happening. Um, it does lead to some serious mental health conditions and we often see this weekly on TV with our prominent sports stars. And lastly, people who are really triumphant. We also see that on the way down the mountain, once they've had their conquest, once they've had their win, this is often when we see people um, die or get into trouble. Um, so they're not immune from these things happening. It's really common. I'd like to hammer that home. I'll get you now to look to the person left, look to the person right. And if you can see down the bottom, we've got our 50% statistic. So, is it you or is it the other person? <laughs> it's probably definitely me. Okay. 
All right, so again, this really leads us to that question. You know, we've got these two different paths we can travel down. We've got resilience on one hand, we've got burnout on the other hand. Why is it that some people can become more resilient, whereas others, they just burn out? What is the trick? What is happening here? To answer that, we have to have a look at what we're, what we're doing. And the answer is really in being an amateur versus being a pro. Everybody knows what they need to do to look after themselves. Well-being, uh, in, in essence, and not, not, to kind of, um, not to kind of downplay it, what we need to do to look after ourselves can be easy, but it's difficult for us to put that into practice. So what the pros do is they practice what they preach. They take the knowledge of what we should be doing to look after ourselves, and they intentionally do that. And that's the trick, and that's what we're going to be doing today is creating a well-being plan for you guys to intentionally take care of yourselves better. To do that, we're going to have a look at seven life lessons. And to really, um, I suppose, put a little bit of a metaphor around that so that we can uh, understand that a little bit better, we're going to talk about waves of life. So we can think about uh, life as this big ocean and we're all kind of bobbing along. And sometimes there are some waves that will come and buffer up against us. Some of them will be little waves, so kind of those ones up on the shoreline that, you know, we can stand there, they'll lap up against us, and that's okay. It's not really going to knock us around too much. Then if we go out a little bit deeper, we've got these bigger waves. These are things that'll topple us around a little bit. We'll feel the, the ground come out from under us. And then we've got the big dumpers, the tsunamis. These are the things that when they hit us, they'll wipe us out. So we're gonna have a look at what these are because not all waves are the same. We need to actually measure the size so that we can figure out what we need to do next to be able to recover. All right, so a bit of a pop quiz for you guys, and this is where the introversion part comes in. Have to have a little bit of a think for yourselves in terms of, do you know your current level of risk related to illness um, and related to well-being related il illness, and can you stop yourself from over or underreacting to stressful life events? So you don't have to answer this to anybody, just have a little bit of a think about yourself. So how, how well are you doing this at the moment, recognising your own risks and recognising the well-being life events that are happening for you. So what I want you to do now is to actually start to think about what stresses you out. Before we talked in general about things that can generally stress us out, now we're going to get a little bit personal. Again, you don't have to share with anybody, but I'd like you to uh, sit and to think what stresses you out, to write down three things that do stress you out, and then choose one of those things and to hold on to that because that's the basis of what we'll use for building your wellbeing plan around for the rest of the session. So I'll give you guys, again, just to time manage, just about a minute, uh, and I'll bring you back after a minute. All right, I can see most people writing, and I think um, most of you have got at least something down that'll be great to focus on for the rest of the session. Uh, if you haven't, I'm just gonna keep talking to keep us for time, and you can keep writing, feel free, please. All right, so having a look again, we've got waves of different size. We've got those everyday waves, we've got those mid-sized waves, which are a bit more challenging, and then we've got the tsunamis, the things that really, really bump us around. I'll throw it over to you guys. What do you think are some of the regular waves? What are those little daily type things that are hassles, but not necessarily life-changing stressful? And keeping in mind, um, you know, different things will have different meaning to different people. So. We're really just picking up an average approach here. Uh, we're not saying that something should or shouldn't be more or less stressful for, um, for somebody. So what are some of those things that you guys think are those really little regular waves, those daily hassles that we come up against? <laughs> Sorry, one more time. Ah, <laughs> oh, I hate that. <laughs> it's really annoying. Okay, what else? That's a great one. Thank you for starting us off. Getting sick, yeah, having a bit of a cold. It's a bit, yeah, it's a bit annoying. Kids getting sick. Those type of things? Speeding ticket? Speeding ticket, yeah, getting fined. I, nobody likes that. Traffic jam. Traffic jam, getting, or yeah, just getting stuck in traffic and, you know, seeing that guy on the motorbike who is passed nice and free. <sighs> All right. Sorry? Terrible toddlers, I'm right there with you. All right, so we've got a few here, and again, this isn't an exhaustive list, but you can see these are the types of things that we would classify uh, as regular waves of life. So these are the types of things that you guys have seen. Christmas is an interesting one. Even things that are meant to be enjoyable can be a little bit stressful and kind of, you know, can get under our skin sometimes. I can, I can empathize with that one. Um, but, you know, a lot of those other ones you guys picked up. All right, what about these big waves? So some of those things in the middle there, what are the types of things we might think would be, okay, they're not the everyday, but they're, you know, 
going to get our attention. Mm, yeah, yeah. So particularly close friends if people are dying. Yeah. Changing jobs. Yep. Changing roles, changing jobs. A lot to do with change can get wrapped up in that. Workplace conflict. Yes. Mm. Family yeah. conflict. Yeah, family conflict. So all those types of things really to do with change or to, to do with kind of conflicts of that mid-level variety, that's what we're talking about here in terms of those bigger waves. What about the tsunamis? These are the really big things. So this is the really tough stuff. Death of the spouse. Yeah, yeah. That's that's um, pretty much up there. Mm. Mm -hmm. Chronic health illness. Yeah, if you're sick or if someone you really care about is particularly sick, that can be that can kind of classify into our big waves. Divorce. Divorce. Yeah. Mm. All types of different relationship breakdowns of important relationships really kind of fall into this category for us. So we can see, you know, those other types of things too. Even again, things that should be kind of joyful times like retirement can be very, very stressful and we need to kind of plan for how we can bounce back for those different changes in our life. A little bit of a heads up and apologies for anybody who falls into this um, age bracket, but um, this is the reason they call it a midlife crisis. We find that seven out of the 10 biggest waves strike between 43 and 53. That's not me saying it, that's science. Yeah. They say 40 is the new 30 as well too, so you guys in your 30s might be, um, might be kind of in for some of this stuff too. All right. So again, the reason that we have to look at this and, and the reason it's good to think about this is so that we firstly don't overreact to if we, we're getting bombarded with lots of those little waves, we kind of put stuff in perspective, but also and really, really commonly so that we can give ourselves enough time to recover from the big stuff. And that's the thing that a lot of people don't do really well. So to help you guys do that, I'm going to give you two minutes. You've got a handout here, and may I borrow yours, please? What we've got is uh, Holmes and Rahi stress scale. So this is a scale that, um, again, based on science, based on averages. So um, this is based on what stresses the average person out. Get you guys to work through here, and all you have to do is copy the number across in the column if this is, has affected you within the last 12 months, and then total that up at the bottom. If you get a high score, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's good to know about it so you can kind of take some actions to, um, to prevent that. So I'll give you two minutes. If anybody doesn't have one, yeah, I can... There are a few? All right, well, if you'd be so kind. Thank you very much. All right, so again, guys, time managing us. I'll give us two minutes. Thro throw on a little bit of music to help us out there. All right, guys, so again, to keep us moving on for time, I will just keep going, but please do feel free to uh, continue this um, as, I'm, as I'm talking or if you prefer outside of the session. So again, the reason to do this is so that we can really get a good gauge on what's going on for us and what are the, what are the stressful things compared to the average person uh, that are happening for us. And we've got the score down the bottom for you again too. So um, you can see that there's a, a little bit of variance within there. Um, and again, even if you are kind of in the mid or to the high range, that's no need for uh, great alarm because we're going to be working through some ways to get on top of that as well or to, to make that less impactful uh, as much as possible. So what we're going to do now is get you guys to flip over to the other page and on the back what we've got is a wellbeing master plan. And remember before I said up front this is where I get to be the crash test dummy. So I'm going to run through a little bit of uh, mine up front uh, and the way it'll work is I'll show you kind of what I've done and what I've got um, because even as a psychologist, even as a person that goes out and kind of teaches this stuff, I still need to kind of you know wrap myself over the knuckles and apply this stuff to myself because you know sometimes falls off track a little bit. So um, that's, that's why. So for me up here, this is what our wellbeing master plan looks like. And so for me, my, little, my, my I suppose, fairly large stressor um, earlier in this year uh, was unfortunately, um, my wife was diagnosed with cancer. So this happened, you know, like quite a, well, in the beginning of the year, um, she's kind of on track to recovery now, so you guys can not panic and, and chill out. But, you know, at the time, this was a very, very stressful uh, thing that was happening for me. So again, I like to use this because it's a nice real example. Um, apologies, that's not showing up, but my stress scale there was up in kind of the, you know, 250s, 300 kind of zone, um, generally around that time. So that's me. What I'll get you guys now to do is to remember back, I got you to write down those three things that stress you out. So to write down your one thing that you picked up uh, and also, your stress scale number if you have had the chance to go through and add that up. If you haven't, that's okay. You can add that in a little bit later. All right, so I think most people there 
uh, well on the way to having something down, which is fantastic. And we'll use that throughout the session to build on. Uh, and you'll be able to take that away. And again, the resources you've got, um, you'll be able to work on that in your own time too. Now, moving on to lesson number two, it's time to talk a little bit about stress and wipeouts and really what's happening there. Um, and here we're talking about avoiding the double trouble stress cycle. And this, to kind of make it really simple to understand, is that stressing about stress. Because that's when we tend to really cycle down and uh, you know, things, things get to get a little bit nasty. Um, again, introspection time for you guys to have a little bit of a think. So can you recognize your early warning signs? And are you able to stop stress when it's breaking out? So the best way to be able to um, buffer against stress is to know when we're getting stressed and to actually have that circuit breaker and pull ourselves back from the edge and to kind of go, okay, hang on, I need to change something here. So are you able to do that never, sometimes, or always? Again, this can be really, really tricky. Um, in a clinical situation, when I, when I work with um, some clients, some of them say, you know, I just saw red. I, there was no time between when I started to get stressed and, and when I realized I was having a panic attack. So this can be really, really tricky for some people. Wipeouts happen because of our stress reaction. And stress, you know, stress isn't all bad. Stress is kind of, or, or was and, and is quite adaptive. It is protective in a sense. Um, but in another sense, it's, uh, it does cause us sometimes to overstress. If I can get you guys to kind of just grab your, um, grab your thumbs and put them just in the middle of your back there, probably just above your belt, what you'll feel is you'll feel your adrenal glands. Now, this is where um, our stress hormones are generated from. You guys can all stop now. Thank you for listening so well. Um, so this is where our stress, is, our stress hormones are generated from. Now, in the past, this was very helpful for keeping us alive because a lot of the threats in our world, they were physical. So we were out on the plains of Africa. There were lions, tigers, all those type of things that were going to do us physical mortal harm. Now, not so much. We're all in offices, we've got cars, it's all you know, nice, and, nice and safe around the place. A lot of the threats that we have now though are perceived threats. So it's our mind saying, okay, I'm in some sort of danger. Our body hasn't adapted to that state where we're, we're able to recognize that I'm not in physical danger. Um, potentially some of, um, some of the danger that I'm in is I'm overreacting to a particular stimuli. And this is really normal. So stress is helpful. It keeps us on guard. It gets us to pay attention when things are off. But excessive stress can really lead to these couple of disorders, which are the two most common uh, psychological disorders in Australia. So anxiety, which is getting really, really worked up and um, really anxious and, and um, worried about different situations. And then the opposite of that, which is depression. So that really low affect. And we've probably, again, these are quite common conditions within Australia. We probably either have at some time um, experienced this ourselves, or we've known of close family, friends, or acquaintances that have experienced this too. And the reason that we go from here to here is again, stressing about stress as the really easy way to sum it up. So something happens, we get anxious. Then we get angry because we're anxious. Then we get depressed because we're angry. Then we get sad and it just continues, continues, continues. And if it continues like that, it's no wonder that we burn out because it just feeds on itself. It's a self-fulfilling uh, mechanism. So what we really need to do is we need to kind of cut that loop off we need to do something, we need to intervene. The way we do that is we recognize what are the signs of stress so that we can jump in before we take that leap from just having normal levels of stress to extreme levels of stress. So again, for me, I'll get you guys to turn back to your wellbeing plan. For me, my stuff was really kind of being quite tense, um, you know, a bit of anger around and, and also really kind of withdrawn. They were the three things that were kind of really happening for me at that time. Give you guys 30 seconds to think about what is it for you? What are your signs of stress? When do you know that you're potentially escalating in terms of the stress that's going on in your life? All right. Again, I think everybody has something which is fantastic. And again, you know, it's not easy to pick these things up. Sometimes it's too late. But the more we draw our attention to it, the better off we'll be. Our next tip in terms of well-being is really looking to be able to balance the four well-being elements. And I'll tell you what those are right now. The really important elements for us are mindsets, emotions, lifestyle, and purpose. We need to try to get these things in sync because if we do, our well-being is going to be boosted. If we don't, we can have some, some really kind of, um, really kind of um, adverse consequences. So again, thinking for yourself, how good are you at balancing these things all the time? And again, not tricky or not, not, uh, not easy uh, in, in the type of life that we lead. So, to put some more metaphors around some of these things, um, 
mindsets we could, we could think of as wins. So really powerful, can kind of push us in the great direction, can really kind of clear the way and clear the path. But at the same time, if we don't have control over our mindsets, can really kind of like messing up leaves, can be really like a tornado and really kind of throw some things around for us. Emotions, thinking about those similar really to water. So in, in an environmental context, it's really important that we have enough water and that water's kind of flowing through. If it floods, if our emotions get too out of hand, that's bad, that's bad, and we need to kind of get on top of that. In terms of our lifestyle, really thinking about this in terms of the soil and the earth, so really kind of grounding us and needing to kind of nurture that so that we're on really stable footing. And then the last one in terms of fire, so our purpose. So really that little spark that keeps us going, that makes every day interesting to be alive. So if we get these things, four things right, fantastic. If we don't, like we see in nature, we kind of have those fires, floods, droughts, things not going well at all. So thinking about our mindsets, can we change them? And as pros, that's what we aim to do. So can you change your mindsets? Oops. So can you change your mindsets to live free of blame, worry, and also demand? So these are the next core things that we're going to be thinking about. So these are the troublesome mindsets that really can kind of get us, get us off on the wrong foot or really get us in trouble. So within our life, we've got two different things going on. We've got our story. So these are the physical things that we see right here, right now. So for example, this is me standing in the room giving the presentation. And then we've got our backstory. So this is the little voice going on in our head that's really kind of talking about what does this mean for us? So for me, one backstory in terms of a positive one could be, oh wow, okay, everybody's looking, they're paying attention, they're really quiet, fantastic. A dark mindset on the other hand could be a worrisome mindset that, oh man, everybody's looking, they're really, really quiet, they're not interacting, it's horrible, they're hating it. So you can see we've got two different choices we can make in terms of those mindsets. And the three different types of mindsets that we've got that really kind of separate that out, we've got worry, demand and blame. And these are the ones that really can, um, can trip us up. So in terms of worry, the opposite of that is accepting. So worry, we tend to overgeneralize, we tend to jump to conclusions, we tend to think the worst. Acceptance, on the other hand, is where we tend to know, okay, we don't control everything. Not everything's going to go our way, so we have to just accept that, move along, roll with the punches. Demand, again, very, very common. We want the earth to bend to our will. We think things should be this way, Things aren't fair, but they must be this way. Things have to change. Whereas, really, all we can do realistically is to encourage things to go our way. And lastly, in terms of blame, we tend to give away our power to things that are outside of ourselves. We blame how we're feeling on outside influences. I'm angry because you did this. Whereas, really, we need to be able to take responsibility for the way that we're feeling in terms of our mindsets. To do this, again, can be quite tricky, but there are a couple of different questions we can ask from cognitive behavioral therapy that can really help us to, to stop this and to kind of intervene. Firstly, is it true? Now, in some cases, th some of these things are gonna be true. Some of the ways we're thinking are gonna be true. But beyond that, even if it's true, is it helpful? Is it helpful to be thinking like this right now? And if we can make that jump, that's really what's going to be able to help us in terms of improving in terms of mindsets. So turning back over again to have a little bit of a look at our um, wellbeing master plan. And for me, really, the one that was predominant was worry right at the top. And, you know, at the time, that, that was one that I just couldn't let go of. Um, I had to really make that shift and I had to jump in terms of to be able to acknowledge and accept that I couldn't uh, fix everything. But I did have to kind of counter that and go, well, all right, I just need to enjoy the good stuff. I need to hang on to what I can. So, I'll throw over to you guys to think about with your particular issue that you've got up the top there. Where are you at the moment? Which type of mindset do you fall into? And what could you do in terms of shifting over to that other mindset? All right, and so next up, we're gonna be talking about emotions. So moving that along, and again, we know in terms of that environmental analogy, we've gotta have our river to flow, but not to overflow. So again, can you recognize and manage your emotions effectively so that they don't get out of control? 
again, with clinical clients, this one can be a real challenge for some people. So even if you're kind of down at the never end, that's, that's not a problem. If we have a look at our friend Steven Seagal here, he has an emotional range of one. Most people have a little bit more of an emotional range than he does. Again, we need to recognize the emotions that we have in order so that we can prevent that baggage and kind of, again, similar to our mindsets, so we can jump in when we know what's going on for us. So when we're managing our emotions, there's a couple of different things we can do. So we've got a path on one hand, and really, again, this is something that if we can kind of take a step back and can think through this, um, it can be really, really helpful in terms of getting us on the right track. So the first one is really thinking about all the things that are going on for us in terms of issues or problems. And to start to think and go, well, you know, is this even my problem? So for example, if we've got some world events going on, in some cases, they may not be. So no, you know, this is happening the other side of the world away, nothing to do with me. I'm not concerned with it. I'm just going to put it out of my mind. So I'll try and use some coping skills. On the other hand, it might affect us, it might be our problem, it might be more, more close to home, it might be something that we have to deal with. Then we need to ask, can I change it? Do I have the power to affect and to in, uh, improve this situation? Sometimes, no, it's gonna be something that is happening to me, it's unfortunate, I don't like it, but there's nothing I can do. In my case, that's really around that, the sick, my sick wife. So nothing I could do for me had to fall back in terms of coping skills. In other cases, your issue may be something that, yes, you can do something about. So for example, if you lose your job, you can put in some steps to go and rectify that situation and you can, you can recover from that. So it's really about thinking which, of this, which path is going to serve me better in terms of controlling those emotions. Now, problem solving skills, we do really, really well at work. We tend to do really, really poorly in our personal life. In our work, we tend to work through all of these, um, you know, seamlessly, particularly in project management type roles and things where we're really regulated. When we're at home, we tend to jump from here to here. We tend to come up with an issue and then just implement something and try to make things better. What we really need to do is to slow down and to work through that problem solving uh, matrix and the way of doing things. On the other hand though, when we can't problem solve, we need to really think about our coping skills. So I'll throw it over to you guys to have a little bit of a chat to the person next to you to think about what are the different coping skills that you've seen? So there may have been things that you've done personally, or they might be things that, um, that you've kind of seen family and friends do. So I'll give you just one minute to have a chat and we'll do a little bit of collection and we'll see uh, what you guys come up with compared to um, the collection that we've got up here already. Alrighty guys, so we'll pull it up there and tell us about some of your coping strategies. So the effective ones, maybe also some of the ineffective ones too. It's good to, um, good to flag some of those. All right, all those guys who kind of filed in and quickly raced to get a seat at the back, do you guys have any, uh, any suggestions in terms of the coping skills? Mm. Again, somewhat helpful as a distraction sometimes in moderation, but can, as we'll see, kind of get us into trouble in some other ways. So I can see both sides of that one. Exercise. <laughs> Exercise, yes, another good one. Meditate. Meditation, yes. Has anybody had a lot of experience with meditation? Yeah, a few people in the room, it's fantastic, yeah. Mindfulness is a, is a really big one that's kind of coming out now and I know um, a lot of people have probably had a lot of experience with mindfulness. Any others? Yeah, social support is probably, in terms of research, the biggest and most effective uh, coping strategy for the average person. So again, you know, different things work for different people, but social support is, you know, up there in the number one, two kind of spot generally, we'll find. Yeah, yeah, use the situation as humour, turn it around, even dark humour. We find uh, in hospital situations that um, nurses have a fantastic sense of dark humour if you ever get to kind of sit down and, and, and talk with them around kind of how their day's been. Anything else? Eating right. Yeah, eating right, doing all those other good things that are going to kind of take care, take care of. And again, these are not things that are, are really unique or different. These are things we know and things that we've got control over doing. So you guys pretty much nailed most of those different types of things. And... You know, a few of these, they're variations of, um, of different ones as well. So, you know, mindfulness, breathing, relaxation, they're all kind of rolled up into that same type of, um, same type of field in terms of being something that's really, really good for us to be able to take that time out and to refocus. So if we do get it right, 
you know, things are going to be really, really going well for us. But again, if we do get it wrong in the case, if we turn to some coping strategies, for example, illicit drug use, that can tend to, um, you know, be a distraction, but it comes with, you know, its own other problems. So again, it's really thinking about what are the healthy coping strategies that I can lean towards. And if I am using some of the more unhealthy coping strategies, how can I move away from those and towards some of the more healthy coping strategies? Um, so for me, again, like this was one that I really had to, um, had to kind of think about. And for me, the social support aspect was a really, really important one uh, when I was going through this time. So I definitely concur with the research. How about you guys? I'll throw it over to you, um, 30 seconds to think about what's your coping at the moment? Where are the areas that you need to focus in on um, and what's gonna kind of tip it from this way to this way? All right, guys. Now, for those who haven't, experience meditation. Today is your lucky day because we have a quick three minute booster of meditation that I'm going to get you guys to run through. So when you have had the chance to fill out um, your wellbeing plan, um, I'd like you just to kind of sit back, relax, and the next three minutes are yours to enjoy. Um, and then we'll be coming back and, and pushing on. And we've got the last two to go. Um, we'll try to get you guys out of here on time or um, even just a little bit after if that's okay. Apologies about cutting that off there with the battery 100% at the end, but was that, um, how was that for people? Just even kind of taking that two, three minutes out of the day, just to kind of sit, recenter, focus, and breathe a little bit. Not bad? Yeah, yeah. Again, so there's lots of different apps, lots of different free downloads you can get from the internet. Just throw on your phone, two minutes, kind of take that time away, pop in the headphones, um, and can do a really, really world of good. A lot of research in terms of being, doing this and having that consistent practice, really, really improving people's outlook over the long term. So I think they say it's around between three weeks and six weeks. If you do that consistent practice, you really feel like you're able to concentrate more uh, and be able to get a lot more out, um, out of meditation there. So we've got the last couple to go. And again, I know we're pushing up against time, so we'll try and go uh, quickly. But the last couple really, first one is really around uh, lifestyle. So again, this is our soil. This is the thing that grounds us uh, and you know this is probably the one that I, I have to put my hand up for is, is probably my uh, the area that I fall down uh, with the most so you know really do you have the self-discipline needed to optimize your lifestyle and physical well-being for me personally I would say never um, your answer may be different um, so as we go through we know as Australians though it's quite common we're really 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 bad at physically taking care of ourselves and we kind of pay the price in terms of uh, all of the different health conditions that we're seeing kind of really increasing uh, at the moment particularly in terms of um, diabetes and, and the like so we also do know though um, the reason why and that's because when we're stressed it's a lot easier to take the easy option when we're stressed it's a lot easier to try to have a, um, a distractor so for example um, Netflix pop that on uh, at night binge watch and be really really tired the next day not get enough sleep so in one sense we're relaxing ourselves but in the next sense we're setting ourselves up the next day for a worse day when we're really stressed it's really easy to go grab some fast food and you know, go for the sugary, the high fat type stuff, rather than going for the healthy option or cooking at home. Um, that's just what happens. So we need to have that discipline in order for us to be able to do what we need, we know we need to do to get good quality sleep. We need to set that regular routine. We need to be able to wake up at the same time. Um, we need to make sure that we're not having that screen time before bed, rather than what I do, which is stay up really late, use the iPad and answer emails in bed. Um, so we really need to, again, we all do this, um, but we all can do it better. Again, with food, we know, and th these are things that we've been taught from a very young age, if we get on top of, we'll be feeling a lot better. So we know we should be really jumping for the fruit and veg, whereas a lot of us, when we're stressed, tend to go for the high fat, high sugar. And we know, again, with exercise, it's that use it or lose it type situation. Um, but I have to say it's a lot more tempting to kind of sit on the couch than it is to get up at five and, and go running. But we know if we do do that, our mental well-being is going to be a lot better off. So for me, again, yes, hands up, this is my guilty area. Um, I really needed to um, get out a little bit more, so take a 30-minute walk at lunchtime. Really needed to stay away from the fast food and needed to go to sleep at the same time every night and ditch the screen time in bed. Throw it over to you guys. This is the second last one in terms of your well-being plan. Um, and have a little bit of think about what areas could you improve on or what areas at the moment are hitting you in terms of well-being that you think you can increase your well-being plan with. 
All right. And now, lastly, we're in the home stretch in terms of our wellbeing plan. And once we've got this one complete, you guys will be good to go. We've got purpose. So again, we need to have that why to be able to endure the how. So in your life, do you have a life purpose? Is it clear for both that big picture and the little picture? So the long term and the everyday. And are you living to really have fulfillment and enjoyment? Are you kind of having those mini adventures and putting in those little nice things that make life worthwhile living? Um, again, when we're stressed, sometimes we tend to turn in or turn to work or just turn to, um, turn to doing other things and our hobbies and the things that we really enjoy tend to fall away. If we think about life, we do have kind of those everyday situations. So we think about like a small bridge crossing and then we've got those really big life events that happen. Um, if you're an architect, you'll really know that a bridge in order to kind of stay together like that. So an arch, it needs pressure. So here, if we've got too much pressure, so stress, we're gonna crack and fall apart. But we need enough pressure, so those good, happy life events to be able to hold that bridge together. And if we've got happy life events, that's gonna help us cross from one life event to the next. It's a really, um, a really, really nice thing. And, and, you know, just to make life worthwhile living. So to do this, we really have to think about four different areas. Uh, and we do it in a little bit of a morbid way, but um, it's, it's a really good way because we really need to start with the end in mind. If we don't have that end point in mind in terms of how would we like to be remembered in terms of our legacy, our purpose, um, once we have that set, we can move towards it. So we really like to think about if we've got a legacy in terms of play, work, family, friends and relationships. And if we think about those things and think about how would we like to be remembered, we're more likely to move towards that direction to each day take those little actions that are going to get us there. The other thing that's really helpful in terms of giving us that spark, that fire, that purpose, that life direction is small acts of kindness. Nothing makes us feel better than by doing good things for other people. And as, as much as we can do that, the more we give out, the more that will come back. And it's really that self-fulfilling prophecy. And again, we know that this is what, what happens, but when we're stressed, that's when we tend to stop helping others and tend to turn inwards but we really need to turn outwards and need to focus on others. So for me, again, this was a little bit of an area um, that, that I could have a bit of work on. Um, and so for me, I really needed to start to prioritize family a little bit more. So obviously when my wife was, uh, was sick, it was really important. I have two young boys to spend a lot more time with them to think about you know, taking some trips with them and going around with them. So um, for you guys, what is it for you? So again, 30 seconds to think about what are the things in terms of your purpose, your life goal, your life direction? And, you know, we can't, um, I suppose, do a full section uh, on life purpose. It's a, it's a really, really um, in-depth topic, but you will find within the book that there are a lot more resources in terms of helping you uh, towards defining a life purpose, if that's something that you're really interested in. So I'd encourage you to have a look at that a little bit later. All right, guys, so we're coming towards the end of the session today. And by now, what we've got is we have a fully completed wellbeing plan. Now, again, I would really advise that you've got this plan. Don't just throw it in the bin on the way out. Don't just kind of pop it in the filing cabinet drawer um, when, you, um, you know, when you get back to the desk. If you've taken this seriously and if you kind of um, really apply this, I'm sure that over time you'll really see the different benefit that it has when you do get to face that adversity Having this plan, updating it regularly and using the stuff in it is really going to help you turn more towards resilience rather than burnout. It's also going to help you to get up when you know, we do have those little knockbacks from life. It just happens. These things just work. It's going to really also help you to look back and to see at the end of life when, um, you know, when we're at the end there that life is more a glass half full rather than half empty. We'll see more beauty rather than that, um, that pressure that we were talking about before. And so it is over to you guys. Thank you very much. I've really enjoyed um, hanging out with you guys today. Happy Friday. Um, all the best for the rest of your day. I'll hang around and answer questions too if you guys want to.